So now let's switch over to gender and sexual minorities in Kerala. Um, so there are gender and sexual minorities. Uh, recently, they've used terms like gay, lesbian, and transgender to mobilize, and they use this primarily because it's uh, it coincides with the language used by transnational queer and trans politics, um, and primarily is centered on a Western mode. So, but this has a class distinction to it. So those people and activists who are engaged in conversation with people in the West um, may use these terms more frequently than people who are uh, working class um, and, you know, who are living in the streets from when they were young and may identify with more indigenous terms like Aravani or Hijra uh, yeah, or something like that, or Koti, Panti, things like that. Uh, then we have another category, which is MSM, and this is men who have sex with men. So there are straight men, heterosexual men, who do have sex with uh, men, but they don't identify as homosexual or participate in homosexual culture. Uh, if homosexual or gender deviant cultures, they don't express themselves like that. Um, the interesting thing is because the reason this category was developed and was developed in the US was uh, during the AIDS crisis in the US, they had to explain why all these straight men were getting uh, HIV and how were these straight women getting infected because it was framed as a gay disease. Uh, but it's because there are men who do have sex with men but may not identify as gay or anything. And again, these are categories, gay, lesbian, transgender that have developed in the West and don't clearly map on, but because people have to politicize, they may appropriate this when necessary. And historically, these groups have, uh, along with sex workers, mobilized around HIV and AIDS prevention, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. Recently, the politics have changed, but I will leave the discussion of all the recentization for um, what we hope to have uh, queer and trans activists from Kerala uh, on future panels to speak more to this and what the current situation looks like. Uh, oh, so you yeah. talk about men having sex with men and having more male dominant homosocial spaces. What about then for the women? So for women, it's primarily, this is the thing, right? As I showed, uh, respectable women stay in the domicile. They don't go into public spaces. They don't go to school. They don't go for higher education. Historically, that's been the case. Uh, but nowadays, primarily that happens through, uh, through uh, women's hostels or other homosocial spaces uh, where women gather, right? Um, or through female friendship networks through school or something like that. Those are generally where uh, homosexual uh, women's co contact happens. But it's less visible, primarily because also uh, males as the population have a high tendency to be non-gender conforming and uh, homosexual than females as a population. Um, and historically in a patriarchal society, the fixation is about correcting males, biological males that deviate, whether they be trans women or uh, effeminate gay males. Um, those are the bodies that are corrected and there's a fixation and a paranoia of correcting those bodies more so than women because women are seen as secondary in their priorities and women's sexuality is not seen as threatening unless they are partaking in sexuality with other males. So that's why we see dominant class women's sexuality heavily policed uh, because it's the fear that they may be polluted or violated or produce children of mixed uh, unknown caste you know, all of these things are the preoccupations around policing women's bodies. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's just the language of patriarchy. I don't know what to say about that. That's why there's this invisibility largely. For this. Yeah. But uh, there are authors currently working on that and writing and bringing that more to light. Yeah. And I wonder uh, but, too, how much, because yeah. it's such a patriarchal system, how much we just devalue women's stories. And so we just don't hear about it because we don't care to look. Yeah, and also when it's confessed, generally there's a dismissiveness to it too. Uh, versus when a male confesses it, there's an immediate like urge to correct it. And you see this uh, in trans populations. So there's this book, uh, Trans Kids, that I uh, recently read for my uh, gender theory course. And in that, um, the author describes how even at the age of two or three, parents would take efforts to correct their uh, boys so not the boys, but like the, the male children's gender behavior, if it was more feminine, they would go in and correct it. At the age of two or three, these are children we're talking about, right? Versus like 
uh, female children that were allowed um, until the age of like nine, 10, 11 uh, to be tomboyish, you know, or masculine. And that wasn't really heavily corrected. And later on, maybe they would go through measures. But the fear is because in a patriarchal society, there has been an emphasis on correcting uh, biologically male bodies that gender or sexually deviate. And that's the priority has been given. Uh, parents start at a very young age to do interfere into that, right? Uh, and the silencing of feminine stories and feminine experiences uh, of cisgender women, so to say, um, comes out of nobody taking that seriously because it's not seen as a threat to the patriarchal order. Uh, so Chandapurta is a Malayalam movie that uh, has Dilip in it, and Dilip is expressing a feminine uh, gender here in this movie, but he still identifies as a man in this movie, but his grandmother raised him as a girl or as a woman because she was frustrated that nobody in her family uh, had given birth to female children. So it's interesting because within his village, nobody really seems to care that he is expressing femininely, uh, except a group of bullies uh, of young men who bully him. But even then, it's a very interesting negotiation. But this is, again, this is a fishing village. And it's interesting how they are more accepting of uh, Radha Krishnan's or the character Radha Krishnan's gender deviance compared to the dominant group where he shows up on another shore and gets re-socialized as a male or as a man, so to say, um, by a Syrian Christian family so that he can return to his village and avenge his parents' death because he needs to be seen as masculine in order to take on masculine attributes like physical aggression or you know, physical prowess so that he can challenge uh, uh, the man who killed his parents in the movie. But that was one of the first depictions of a gender, non-gender conforming behavior. Interestingly enough, even at the end of the movie when Dilip is you know, masculinized, uh, Radha Krishnan um, still has certain like kinesthetic feminine, femininity to him. Um, and so it's very interesting how Lal Joe's depicted that, but this has historically been one of the first instances of depicting that. Well, that's incredible um, because so often we demonize when someone does not conform to gender expression. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so showing that, nope, he still identifies as a man, even if he has some stereotypically feminine traits, he's still a man. Exactly. Is and, uh, reaffirming to those who don't necessarily always align with what the expectation is for their gender expression. Exactly. And it's interesting because you notice in his community, there is no real issue with it uh, until somebody like stirs up a problem and that is more out of a vendetta against his father than against him um, versus the dominant caste community on uh, the other side of the shore where the Syrian Christian, especially Frank, uh, what's her name? Is it Francis? Frankie or something? But the Syrian Christian woman, Rosie, Rosie, yeah. Uh, she is explicitly like homophobic and transphobic in her language against him. Uh, more so than any man is in the movie in the initial phases because she can't tolerate that he's being gender deviant. But nonetheless, she and her brother uh, masculinize him so that he can avenge uh, his father. So there's still this narrative of like, you need to be masculine presenting if you are male in order to be seen as respectable within society. And it's reflective too of how uh, like, it's not just men who police behavior. Women yeah. very often police behavior too. Exactly. And especially dominant caste women are very good at uh, maintaining uh, patriarchy, both by policing the women in the community as well as the men. Uh, and they, they police the men too. If the men, like their husbands, fail to be true men in the sense of being a provider or, you know, keeping money within the family or making decisions, there is language that women use to emasculate the men. Uh, uh, but I'll say a phrase like, like if you are a man, you know, or like, uh, if you are a man, like many women emasculate men in that process if they fail up to meet patriarchal expectations such as being uh, dominant or making decisions or bringing ample income into the family. Uh, so it's a very interesting situation where both males and females can participate in reifying uh, heteronormative and patriarchal structures. Um, so here, what I'm depicting is a protest against Article Section 377, which um, comes out of 
the um, just a second. The 1533, I just wanted to check the year, 1533 uh, Buggery Act uh, coming out of British legislation. And it was introduced in 1861 in the Indian Penal Code and ultimately it penalized uh, non-natural sexual acts. So that would be uh, anal penetration from by one male to another male and uh, bestiality was also included in that. So ultimately it's policing all forms of sexual expression that doesn't happen within a conjugal relationship of uh, between a man and a woman. And this has been mobilized to police uh, both uh, trans women, um, like in the Hijra community, sex workers, as well as uh, effeminate gay men um, or passive recipients, uh, uh, passive homosexuals, so to say. And this was struck down in 2018. And as a result of that uh, decision, what we see here is um, I guess the first public um, homosexual couple. This is Sonu and I'm looking for the other name, but Sonu and his husband, this couple married and uh, they did, obviously didn't get like formal marriage within the Indian government, but nonetheless it brought to light that homosexual relationships exist in Kerala. And it's interesting, probably, so probably following 2018, there's going to be more clear visibility. But the thing is, historically, um, um, all of these discriminatory laws are now being struck down, but positive uh, affirmative legislation hasn't really been uh, applied in the sense of like, you know, anti-discrimination policy or something like that. I mean, in fairness, we don't really have that in many places. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so there's another, um, there's this movie called Kundan. So Kundan is a term that is used in Kerala, both derogatorily and also not derogatorily. It comes from uh, Korikod uh, Malayalam, and it's used to describe a young male, um, a young boy. So um, they, they could just use that term, but it's identifies a certain homosexual culture that preceded uh, modern Kerala, where um, it was almost like a pedestrian system where older males would uh, seek out relationship with younger males and uh, the younger males, the passive recipient, the older males, the penetrative one. And in that relationship, what is set up is almost like a social networking where the young male is also taught uh, skills within trade, uh, merchant, you know, mercantile skills and all of that stuff, in addition to having this romantic and sexual relationship with this older male. But eventually after they reach a certain age, they may um, stop that relationship and maybe enter into it and seek out a younger partner for themselves or something like that um, is how the system goes out. And interestingly enough, you would think like a Muslim community would not have this, but it's because of the heavy social divide uh, between in public spaces or public spaces labeled as masculine private space as feminine. Um, so a lot of these men, they leave their Taravada or families, joint families, and they socialize in public where they may eat a lot, um, you know, pass time there. And it's usually in these spaces where these relationships develop. But interesting enough, because uh, in Kerala, there's this shift towards a very nuclear family heteronormative structure. Um, the Taravada system doesn't exist. And so these men have to now be at home, take care of their children. Um, and because they're prioritizing their wife and children, they're not outside um, being social with other men. And if they're not social with other men, these coordinated relationships really don't really develop. And uh, it's that, that makes it very interesting because uh, strangely enough, even though people see like the nuclear family structure as maybe progressive in certain lights, uh, compared to maybe the antiquated Taravada system. Uh, in essence, what it's doing, it's, it's preventing a possibility for homosexual eroticism to arise or homosexual relationships to arise. Uh, so th I thought that was interesting. And the Othala speak about this in various articles, but it's not really uh, well written about it. But this movie that was released in 2019 uh, by Shafi K. Ahmed is one that you can watch if you want to read. Uh, more or watch or learn more about that community. 
Um, so this is a magazine, Vanita magazine, that is read frequently, or probably the most uh, popular women's magazine in Kerala. And within that, uh, they depicted a transgender woman, Deepthi, for the first time in 2016. And that was a major uh, shift in the dialogue about transgender rights and transgender representation that happened. Um, so, and also there's this book by uh, Dr. Namnita Mokil called Unruly Figures, where she accounts for both sex workers and politics of sexuality and lesbian sexualities uh, within Kerala. Um, and you can read, and there's ample instances of within movies and literary analysis, and she really brings in a lot of text and modes of analysis to bring to light uh, this severely underrepresented uh, sexual minority group, because most people don't know about it, uh, because not much has been written about it until, uh, I guess, maybe Dr. Mokin and a few others have written about it. Uh, speaking of that, uh, in terms of sexuality, sex workers were another group through alongside which many queer and trans folk have mobilized politically. And um, there's this autobiography of a sex worker written by Nalini uh, Jamila. And she writes about her experiences with her various clients and how uh, romance, sexual attraction, and everything was negotiated. And historically, in the 90s, when sex workers were advocating, um, they were mostly advocating around the language of, you know, this victimized uh, sex worker who is taking advantage of, or they have to resort to sexual activity and everything. Um, and changing that narrative to show that there are women who enter sex work but don't see this as dehumanizing, but it's more so the police state coming in, preventing them from safely uh, making uh, money through sex work that has been affecting their life, either by criminalizing sex work or interfering in sex work. Um, so that's an interesting narrative to pay attention to. And disproportionately, it's been a non-dominant caste woman who have uh, partaken in sex work in Kerala. All right, so I described all of that. I illuminated sexual minorities that exist in Kerala. Um, but why are we doing a gendered analysis if we're gonna be talking about Black Lives Matter? Well, when we talk about Black Lives Matter and why Black Lives Matter, there is a gendered way through which uh, both men and women and uh, non-gender, uh, binary folks and other queer and trans folk are negotiating their specific ways through the legislative system because they are both racialized subjects and gendered subjects. Um, so when we look at black males, and I use the word male and female here strategically, because I would say that, and many uh, black scholars argue that historically these uh, two groups were not seen as men and women in their full right, because if they were seen as men and women, they would not be treated as property. Uh, and, or they would not be treated as second-class citizens. So to be reaching womanhood or to be reaching manhood within a given society is to be seen as full members in your gendered way within that society. Um, but that hasn't been the case historically and in many ways currently for uh, Black people. So for Black males, following emancipation, they were flame, framed as Black male rapists, even when they were victims of rape. So for example, uh, if they were like white women making advances on black males could hold a threat that if you scream or if you tell anyone, uh, I'm going to say that you raped me. Or any instance of sexual contact between a black male or, and a white woman were seen by definition as rape because it was inconceivable that a white woman would be attracted to a black uh, male. And also forced penetration, they were forced to penetrate and impregnate uh, enslaved females and uh, black females, for example, were forced uh, for uh, forced, forcibly raped uh, for increasing the enslaved population, right? So black males were forced to impregnate black females as quote unquote the buck and black females were expected to just reproduce to increase the enslaved population for labor. And they also, they are seen as sexually available, over-sexualized, uh, there's stereotypes of the Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire that follows, but also when speaking about black males uh, and their gendered forms of discrimination, because of this myth of the black male rapist, uh, there has been, there historically has been uh, massive lynchings of black males 
whenever they violate that or have come in contact with a white woman. Uh, and also mass incarceration is a response for that because the fear is that if these males are seen as truly men, uh, then they have access to our women. And if they have access to a woman, they are going to uh, dilute the race or take away from that in some capacity. And they, I have to treat them as equals and as racialized subjects because America is founded on this racial hierarchy, they cannot allow non-dominant men to have access to the dominant woman. And you see the same parallels to the protection of uh, Britain or dominant caste women in Kerala, and especially the violence against uh, Dalit Bahujan men and the sexual violence against uh, Dalit Bahujan women by dominant caste men as well. Um, an example of empirical example of this is uh, the mass incarceration of black males. This is from a study from 2018, the incarceration rate per 100,000 people. You can see that the incarceration of black males is almost six times that much of white males. For Latino males, almost three times as much as that of white males. Versus for, uh, though yeah, incarceration is a gendered aspect where there are more men who are incarcerated than women. Um, it is more salient that we see that black men specifically are incarcerated at a significantly higher rate. Uh, so black women are almost at a twice as much as the rate as white women and Latina women are uh, almost, but a little more than white women. There's many an ample discussion about this issue uh, being done in the literature and I'll direct you to these authors. So Black Feminist Thought by Patricia Hill Collins, which builds on the concept of intersectionality introduced by uh, Professor Kimber Kimberly Crenshaw. And uh, Dr. Collins argues that intersectionality is needed in the sense that Black women's experience can only truly be understood if you see it as Black women as both gendered, sex, um, gendered, racialized, and classed co-constitutively. So you can only understand Black women's experience if you can see her as a woman, as Black, and uh, depending on her class, as um, working class or uh, dominant class, whatever it may be. However, Dr. Tommy Curry challenges this argument because he shows through, I guess, like the incarceration rates um, and the strategic exclusion of non-dominant caste males, non-dominant class males uh, within US society, black males have disproportionately been incarcerated, uh, been lynched and been sent for social death, a concept introduced by Michelle Alexander in, New Jim, in the New Jim Crow where she talks about mass incarceration, especially against black males. So this is where my primary research is uh, in addition to Global South Male Studies, but the same logic is at play. Um, so you can see those discussions at play over here. And Imani Perry in her book, Backsay Things, argues for a liberatory feminism that addresses this issue of mass incarceration in addition to promoting uh, an egalitarian futurity. Um, so I recommend reading these Black scholars and what the discussion is and not just having a single-sided either privileging of feminine perspective or a privileging a masculine perspective on this, but engage with the scholarship so you have a more nuanced idea of what uh, the conversation is. Um, and just to emphasize the concept of intersectionality does not prescribe, necessarily prescribe a cumulative oppression. So if you have multiple uh, identities, so your gender identity, your sexual identity, um, your sex identity or your racial identity, all of those complexes if you come in, doesn't make you infinitely more oppressed. It's still primarily your economic uh, positionality that um, determines whether those things then become salient. So all those different identities become more salient when you are poor because you are more victim to the police state interfering and you have less avenues for retribution as a result. Um, also looking at the history of uh, queer and trans politics in the US, the Stonewall riots was primarily led by black trans women and uh, black queer men. Um, unlike, what was the movie just did it, did you? Uh, I can't remember if it was specifically called Stonewall, but it was about the riots where literally they placed the protagonist as a cis white gay man. Exactly. Instead of uh, the black and brown folk who are the ones who are actually leading the way for equality. 
exactly. Um, and uh, the reason for that was primarily because there is a lot of issues economically with LGBT folks. And for example, LGBT youth, the primary reason uh, for homelessness is that they run away from family because of rejection or they're forced out of family because of rejection um, or they have financial insecurity. Also for incarceration rates of gender and sexual minorities, 16% of transgender adults have been in prison and or in jail versus 2.7% of all adults. So that's almost an eightfold, seven to eightfold increase. So by being part of being transgender, you are more likely to be faced with the carceral system than if you are a part of the general population. Um, and the 13 to 15% of youth in detention identify as LGBT compared to four to 8% of the youth population. And this is because LGBT youth, as we've seen, are primarily homeless. And if you're homeless, you don't have the resources to fight the carceral system and you're more likely to be scrutinized within the carceral system uh, than non-LGBT folk. Right, so and it's also not like, might, yeah, go ahead. It's not like an inherent thing, like, oh, because you're trans, you're just more likely to commit crimes. It's because of yeah. the systems that they're placed in, because of the lack of access to resources that this ends up happening. Exactly, and those bodies are policed because it's easier to police those bodies because they'll have less avenues for retribution or justice than normative bodies, uh, because normative bodies are, you know, if, if for example, a because white Because we care woman, about them? Yeah, so if a straight white woman has been violated or murdered or something, the whole country will go down mm -hmm. you know, in flames. And that has historically been the case versus like a trans black woman is just not, that's a disposable body. Right, right? they're not seen, their humanity and their dignity is not seen. Because they're already deviant, it's considered disposable mm -hmm. because they're not seen as productive or they're not seen as you know, lay, um, contributing to uh, maintaining the human population or something. And you see the same language uh, historically uh, with, for example, the um, the Holocaust and how primarily it was uh, gay males and trans women who were sent and murdered uh, during the Holocaust as a result of being gender deviant. Um, there's also a racial disparity between LGBTQ homelessness, as you can see, among the white youth, uh, only 40% are homeless LGBT youth. And uh, of that confined youth, a smaller per percent are white as well, versus of the all the US youth um, among the LGBT population, you see that disproportionately larger they are black youth who are LGBT within the carceral system or homeless. Yeah. Also, there's the known cases of fatal violence against uh, people who are transgender. And you can see disproportionately this again is against trans women. And the reason is against trans women is because, you know, these aren't trans affirmative people who are like, yeah, it's because you're a trans woman, I'm attacking you. They're attacking you because they see you as a male body that has deviated into feminine expression. They're attacking you because you are a male body that's femininely displayed. And you see this in gay bashings historically as well against effeminate uh, men, uh, whether they identify as gay or not, they'll be called, you know, uh, various merit slurs as a result of that. Right, so it's like transphobia tied into it because their refusal to see them as women and it's yes. that they're seeing them as men. They, yeah, they're seeing them as men, um, and, uh, but they're not dignifying them as men, right? If they were dignifying them as men, they wouldn't attack them. Instead, they're, dignifying, they're not dignifying them and so they're attacking them as feminine, as c corrupt men, as fallen men, so to say, right? Anyway, not men, I would say no. males. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you might sorry. not know the answer to this, but it says known cases, right? And so like historically, like when you think about like Marsha P. Johnson's death, they mm -hmm. they didn't classify that like as a murder or a violent death. Yeah. They were like, she was just found. Exactly. And so, so yeah. does this necessarily actually even capture everything? Yeah, it doesn't because many of these things aren't recorded or like hidden hush hush, um, right? Um, because no one wants to get convicted for murder. So a lot of these issues arise. And these are from the known cases. We don't know of all the other violent cases. Um, and many people who are faced with violence may not report it because they're more afraid of the carceral system and how they could be pulled into the carceral system by reporting this than just staying quiet and bearing with the abuse that they face, right? Um, so that's another issue. But you also notice among the murders, a large percent, 80% of them were black 
in the US and 10% were Latinx, 5% are Native American, like 1% of the US population, 1% to 2% is Native American, so 5%. That's crazy. And um, like white people take up the majority of the population in general, and yet there's such a small number on this pie. Exactly. And gen generally, I suspect this is because they're poor uh, that the murder is happening as well. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about like the carceral system, the marginalization, especially as it relates to gender and race that come in, uh, gender, gender, race, and sexuality, and how they all relate. Uh, but there is a positive aspect. So this uh, show called Pose on Netflix uh, that depicts the ballroom culture that developed in New York that was primarily led by Black trans women and uh, Black uh, queer men and a Latinx trans women are, and um, queer men um, who created this vibrant culture that has influenced a lot of the uh, cultural elements that we see in pop culture today. Um, and the issues that they face, how they mobilize around HIV and AIDS prevention, but also shows a positivity to their life and how they build a community uh, faced with their specific circumstances. And it casts trans women as trans women. Exactly. Um, and then Disclosure is a documentary that's on Netflix. It, it, it's about the media representation of trans folk. So like, what did they see in movies? What was seen in TV? and then how that influenced the society at large because media has an impact, representation does matter. So if trans folk are being viewed as these aberrations, then that is going to carry over into the real world. And then it's like this cycle where the real world influences media and influences the real world. And so this documentary really covers that beautifully on how we need to do better in our media to be able to be better in the world. Exactly. Um, and in terms of like queer theory, uh, which is a field of study studying queer and trans uh, folks, um, Gayatri Gopinath is actually a Malayali uh, queer theorist uh, in the diaspora in the US who uh, writes uh, on the queer experiences of South Asian uh, people within the US. And um, so her book, Unruly Visions and Queer Diasporas and South Asian Public Cultures are strongly recommended for those interested in the literature. However, I do want to be careful when I posit all of this. So we have shown that there is gender discrimination that does happen as a result of heavy patriarchal regulation of society. As when there is this emphasis on patriarchy, it's not all men who benefit from this, but non-dominant men that includes gender deviant males, uh, biological males, so that may be trans women or um, homosexual uh, men or queer men, um, and also non-dominant group men uh, are going to be left out from the privileges of patriarchy. And patriarchy polices uh, dominant women's bodies, but simultaneously these women may also partake in reifying these structures by policing each other, by emasculating their, uh, their husbands if they don't live up to the patriarchal standards or socializing their children to live up to the gendered expectations uh, by you know, following endogamous marriage, uh, following gender normative behavior and sexual normative behavior, being sexually chaste uh, prior to marriage, whatever these may be. Um, and that's why a gendered and sexual analysis is critical for us to understand what is specifically happening to the Malabari experience here in the diaspora, based on how we have had to renegotiate gender as a migrant community here, due to maybe like woman-led migrations, or maybe if you're an earlier migrant, you may still follow very patriarchal systems from, the, uh, from Kerala. And then also understand the criticality of the fact that um, this is also the first time anybody has talked in many ways talks specifically about the Kerala context of queer uh, and trans identity um, in the diaspora. Uh, the conversation is happening in Kerala, but in the diaspora, this may be one of the first instances. But we don't want to frame our community as backwards because there are still elements of the colonial policies. Note that these were colonial policies that were introduced and colonial ideas of gender normativity 
uh, Victorian prudishness of nuclear family, uh, you know, patriarchal structures uh, that were introduced that were then valorized by dominant caste people and like maintained in the political system. Um, but Jasper Power, another queer theorist, of South, uh, South Asian queer theorist in the diaspora, uh, in her book, Terrorist Assemblages, brings this concept of homonationalism up, where gender, uh, sorry, queer and trans affirmative policies may also follow the interests of imperialistic policies. So the US may intervene in countries which have non affirmative. Um, or you know, denigrating policies against queer and trans folk, saying that in their intervention they're going to be freeing the queer and trans folk over there. Um, they may be liberating them. We don't want to participate in that because many liberals tend to celebrate this, right? They will maintain the power structures and the status quo as they are, but they're like, oh, we've just brought in this marginalized group, this marginalized identity into this position, and now we're celebrating them. So kumbaya, like great. And this is exactly what you see here with the pride flag, but the, no irony there with the US Air Force sitting there and don't tread on me. And this full on American imperialism, you know, uh, displayed here, but it's queer affirmative. So, you know, you're celebrating it. And you uh, can see that it's imperialism because there are countries that we do not go into despite their persecution of queer folk. Exactly. It's like, why is nobody invading Saudi Arabia or, you know, uh, oh, we know why. Or Singapore or any countries like that is because there's economic benefit to be had there. But, you know, you would gladly go intervene in Afghanistan or Palestine uh, or uh, even in India, so indirectly. So this is uh, this notion called carceral feminism, where a lot of feminist uh, movements, especially white feminist movements, are based on the idea of protecting women. And so they'll go into the developing world and say, like, oh, we're going to stop human trafficking, even though what is being positioned isn't necessarily human trafficking, nor do the people who are working in sex work over there see themselves as being trafficked. Or they'll go in and say we're freeing the gays and the lesbians and the trans folk uh, and give money over there, but intervening in the politics and bringing in very neoliberal ways of uh, Western and globalized influences to then economically bring resources out of this country back to the West, right? Or yeah. create new markets in the uh, in these uh, backward, quote unquote, backward places um, so that they can interfere eventually. And yeah. it's ironic too, because we have stuff we need to work on in the United States alone. So like when you're mm -hmm. talking about like the sex trafficking going in, because we're trying to stop sex trafficking, we have a problem in this country with that. Exactly. Um, but the thing is the idea of sex trafficking is a language that many of these carceral feminists use to maintain uh, modes of power. So uh, Bernstein is a feminist who writes extensively on this. Um, and what she argues, and it just follows also Gayatri Spivak's statement of like um, this idea of uh, white people, white men, white men and women coming in and saving brown men sorry, brown women from brown men. So they're like, for a feminist agenda, I was like, oh, we're bringing freedom to these women. That's where we're going. And I was like, uh, you don't need to do that. There was ways they were mobilizing themselves, but your interference is not necessarily out of interest for those women, but more so to loop them into some kind of market or create some kind of economic dependence on you uh, by these dominated peoples, right? But you're coming with the language of liberation, freedom, democracy, whatever it may be. Yeah, so... Uh, that makes it very interesting. And I think uh, uh, Jasper Power's uh, discussion of homo nationalism is critical to be had here. Um, because we see here that in most of these Western nations, uh, there has been a lot of affirmative action made towards LGBT social progress, but in the global South where which have all been colonized. So it's a very interesting, right? All of these were former colonies inheriting homophobic legislation from their former governments and implementing it or reactionarily. So in a sense, they, what they're doing is setting up patriarchal communities and societies themselves. And as a reaction to Western influence, they posit homosexuality as a Western influence instead of looking into their own history and identify that historically they've had gender and sexual minorities and there hasn't been historically been an issue with that. But recently, they take on a very patriarchal idea uh, and police that. But the US or you know, 
uh, I guess France or the UK intervening in these countries will say, oh, but we need an enlightened idea of patriarchy. A patriarchy is where there's a nuclear family set up. It could be, you know, two women that are together. So a lesbian couple or a gay couple, or, you know, we're trans affirmative, all of that. But nonetheless, uh, we are going to make you economically dependent on us in this process. So it becomes a very complex and nuanced history. I don't have time to exhaust all of that and discuss that here. But if you read the literature, you'll get a better idea of that. So we always have to be careful, even though we are being queer and trans affirmative, especially when it comes to black lives in the US, that we don't take a queer and trans affirmation and demonize the old world because we have to be charitable to the fact that this is an influence of a colonial legislation and colonial uh, governance, but also a reaction of setting up a patriarchal system um, to challenge the patriarchal system of uh, colonial patriarchy, so to say. So you're creating a domestic patriarchy in response to colonial patriarchy. Right, and I think um, something else that's important is that a lot of the pushback that is given um, against the Western ideas are because the West have gone in and destroyed these countries and they're like, go away, we don't want you anymore. Exactly, and so, uh, they, um, what is it, gender and sexual minorities are seen as deviant or Western. Uh, and you see that in language in India too, where hijras are actually seen as indigenous. And uh, the you know, third gender rights uh, actually proceed in many terms of same sex rights uh, in these places because the concept of third gender wasn't foreign to them. It was seen as indigenous uh, compared to the word gay or lesbian, which is seen as more foreign or Western in its influence. Uh, so it's very interesting how those can be complex and nuanced in their own way. However, I do want to end because we are also trying to affirm uh, this is the first discussion of, uh, I, I would say I haven't seen any discussion prior to this in any uh, substantial sense about uh, gender and sexual minorities in the Malayali community. And so for if you are a gender uh, queer, gender non-normative uh, or um, a sexual minority, there are places where you can reach out and gain support. Uh, Tricorn is a South Asian LGBTQ organization, mostly in the California Bay Area, but they have chapters all across the country. The Bay City LGBTQ Helpline for South Asians is another source. We will also, as Malayali So Black Lives Matter, as part of the series, be providing ample resources out there, having discussions, bringing visibility to the queer and trans people that exist in the uh, Malabari community in the diaspora. And if you want to also connect with the queer politics in uh, Kerala, there's Queerla, uh, which is an organization uh, that has been established uh, to fight and bring visibility towards queer and trans politics in Kerala. So with that, um, my hope was to show that we do have a rich history of, of sexual and gender diversity within Malabar. So if anybody makes a claim that it is a westernization or foreign influence, you can push against that. Um, the reason these communities are demonized is because of a very patriarchal notion that uh, limits expression in terms of freedom, mobility, economic expression for both cis uh, and transgender uh, people. And ultimately it's also complicated with colonialism. Colonialism was introduced and we uh, moved towards a colonial way of being even though we had various forms of uh, social formations, matrifocal, matrilineal, uh, patriarchal, patrilineal that existed in Kerala uh, prior to the introduction of the nuclear family uh, the, or the emphasis on the nuclear family system that came uh, with the British. And um, ultimately, on just bare power's term, we shouldn't become homo nationalists, uh, especially when living in the global north uh, in this dominant country like the US and make sure that our participation isn't demonizing uh, subjugated groups within our own country and around the world and under the language of progressive gender and sexual politics. Yeah, so that's all I really have. Well, Jyotis, thank you so much. You covered a lot of information in a fairly short amount of time that we don't really discuss, that we haven't really been taught. So I really appreciate you bringing this to us, bringing this knowledge to us. and. I appreciate the audience for their willingness to hear about this, to learn more about our queer folk in our own community. 
All right. So I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.